Hola, muchas gracias, Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias. Álvaro. Gracias, César. Hola, muchas gracias, Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias. Álvaro. Gracias, César. Hola, muchas gracias, Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias. Álvaro. Gracias, César. Ok. Entonces. Hola, muchas gracias, Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias. Álvaro. Gracias, César. Bien, vamos a esperar okay. un momento. Sí. Bien, yo Vamos. creo entonces que ya podemos empezar, creería. Entonces, ok. Sí. Everybody, good afternoon. My name is Cesar Meneses. Mm, and bien. I am gonna be yo creo entonces que ya podemos empezar, a, creería. Our uh, symposium. And uh, today it is a pleasure to present uh, Professor Mario Lopez Gopar and Professor Vilma Huerta Cordova. Uh, but uh, before that, there are some brief announcements that I would like uh, to uh, do uh, before we get started. So there was a small change in the schedule So today at 4.35 p.m. in the room D, uh, the concurrent session teaching in an EFL, uh, teaching EFL in a rural context through place-based education, expressing our, pre our place experiences through short poems by Pilar Salazar, uh, it's going uh, to, to, to be presented. And uh, of course, uh, it is important to let you know that any questions or comments will, will be, uh, you know, uh, getting them from the chat uh, during the plenary. So you can uh, leave your questions and comments along the session. And at the end, we will have a very brief space in order to discuss them. Okay. Now there's another chain. Uh, there's another announcement in case you had any inconveniences with the session links. Uh, the only thing you have to do is to copy and paste the link in a new tab. And from there, you will be allowed to get in okay uh, well so uh, as I said before it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Vilma Huerta Cordova and Dr. Mario Lopez Gopar uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, Vilma Huerta Cordova is a professor of language education in uh, UABJO she has a PhD uh, In critical social in critical language studies, uh, Dr. Uh, Vilma Huerta's research uh, focuses on collaborative learning, peer tutoring, and interpersonal relationships in the classroom to promote equity in education. Her latest book is "Ganar Ganar: La Tutoría entre Colegas y la Conciencia Pedagógica." Um, and uh, Dr. Mario López Gopar. Uh, He is a PhD from OISE, University of Toronto. He is a professor at Universidad Autónoma Benito Juárez de, o de Oaxaca. Uh, Mario's main research interest is uh, intercultural and multilingual education of indigenous peoples in Mexico. He has received over 15 academic awards. His latest books are The Colonizing Primary English Language Teaching Multiling uh, from Multilingual Matters. 2016, it was published in that year, and International Perspectives on Critical Pedagog uh, Pedagogies in ELT, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, 
Professor Huerta, Professor Lopez, you can take the floor now. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna start sharing my, my screen, if you don't mind. And uh, you let me know whether you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can see it now. Yep, perfect. Okay, let me just unload this. Excellent. And um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, uh, Dr. Vilma Huerta Cordoba and myself, Mario Lopez Gopar, will be presenting on developing critical language educators within coloniality, the subjectification of languages, right? Um, before we begin, um, uh, let me say thank you first. Gracias to Dr. Alvaro Quintero Polo for inviting us you know, to present at this conference. Also, I would like to thank the conference organizers for putting uh, this event, especially at this, you know, at the moment that we're living. And uh, also, I would like to thank Universidad Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for the organization and the invitation. Right. Um, Today, Bill and I would like to um, accomplish two main purposes for this presentation. Um, first, it will be my, my turn to discuss the hegemony of Spanish and English resulting in the historical marginalization and stigmatization of indigenous languages and peoples. Basically, I'll be talking about ourselves. It will be interesting to see whether you consider yourself part of that group, right? And that in many ways equals modernity and coloniality. Um, later in the presentation, then uh, Vilma will um, try to accomplish you know, the following objective, to present the results of a qualitative study whose aim was to develop critical language educators and to subjectify languages. Then um, after that, then I'll come back and you know, basically talk about uh, implications and the conclusions, and then uh, we'll answer any questions that you may, you may have. Um, we um, we missed the interaction with people, so please please feel free to um, leave your questions as we're presenting, so we can address. Uh, we'll try to um, follow um, and maybe do this in forty minutes, so we have at least fifteen minutes to talk to you. For us, this is very very important. So please feel free to ask as many questions or uh, anything that you disagree with. We we'll love love to hear that. Okay. Um, Every time uh, Bilma and I present, we always like to make a deal with our audience, you know? especially if we're not making any sense. So this is starting to you know, get uh, boring for you. Please let us know and uh, we can all go for lunch and uh, we can all um, eat this piece of animal maybe for lunch. We may get a, you know, upset stomach, but anyway, so we'll go from that. Or um, we can gossip about our neighbors, our Northern neighbors and how they affect us, you know, here we see the two candidates actually that are being elected in the US playing with the world as it is in many ways. Okay. Um, or we can enjoy the moment like Greta Thunberg, right? You know, who's saying, relax, Donald, right? Uh, they, uh, I'll be showing you a lot of cartoons, you know, um, especially from, from this gone from La Jornada, which is a, a left critical newspaper in Mexico. So go enjoy that. Um, so, um, first of all, let me uh, tell you a little bit about modernity and coloniality that actually started in 1492 to the present, I argue, and we argue. And uh, this whole thing started with the so-called uh, discovery of America and, uh, and how this is actually being portrayed in the history of uh, Mexico and Latin America. And every time I present on this and I discuss this issue, right, I ask people, you know, the name of the ships and everybody can tell me it's La Niña, La Pinta, La Santa Maria, right? But as soon as I ask people what the name of this guy is, then nobody knows because actually the, the people who were on this side were not really uh, important in the history as it is being presented. So um, Mexico, like many other Latin American countries, suffered colonialism for 300 years, right? As you may know, um, in 1821, Mexico became uh, so-called independent, right? And uh, we could actually argue that, or some people argue, especially in the um, official history, that, you know, that's the independence period or the post-colonialism period. However, uh, Latin American thinkers and others have argued that uh, that actually um, colonialism never ended, leaving a state of coloniality uh, behind. And uh, actually part of that uh, coloniality aspect is the mere fact that, you know, um, the Spanish language is in many ways the, the language spoken in uh, most of Latin American countries, right? And then also the fact that, you know, I'm giving this presentation in English and not in Nahuatl really speaks to that coloniality aspect. So, 
you know, uh, funny enough, and just just to show, you know, the, the aspect of coloniality, even up to uh, six months ago, the statue of Christopher Colón was part of, uh, you know, the scenery of Mexico City, right? So, in, you know, not only did, you know, basically take the gold from our country, but then we actually uh, had a statue for him for 500 years. So that really speaks to the coloniality aspect of it. So, um, you know, when we're talking about modernity and coloniality, it's very, very important to um, acknowledge the fact that they come together. Uh, they are basically um, one invents the other, right? So it is um, basically uh, two sides from the same coin. And uh, Mignol and others, right, have actually defined modernity as the manner in which colonial power controls or dominates a community by imposing on that community certain Western or Eurocentric models of subjectivity authority, economy, and knowledge, right? Just, just to, you know, um, you know, basically uh, analyze this, this quote, subjectivity in many ways speaks to who is and who isn't, right? Who's considered a doctor and who's considered, you know, not a doctor, like a curandero, right? And that has been referred to as the coloniality of being. And authority and economic is who decides, you know, who has the, you know, the power of the world. Actually, we're seeing in many people now, especially in the, and U.S. elections, right? Is it like, it is not really the Democrats or Republicans. It is, you know, like people in power who are actually controlling that. And also knowledge, when we talk about knowledge, is who knows and who doesn't. And that has been referred to as colonial knowledge. Uh, if you uh, did not attend yesterday the presentation by Carlos Granado Beltran or Astrid Núñez Pardo, we did a fantastic job at actually explaining all those three, uh, these three concepts. And, um, just just to uh, let you know that many other people have actually um you know talked about this like uh, Sousa Santos describes this phenomenon at the sociology of absence the ignorant the delayed the inferior the local or particular or the unproductive right later on I'll be making connections as to how this pertains to ELT especially right so um before I move into um uh, ELT, um, let me introduce to also the, not only the concept of coloniality further, but also the concept of colonial difference, and especially the creation of the Barbaro, uh, as it was described by, by Mignolo. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, funny enough, after the, uh, the conquest of Latin America, right, they, they held a, um, a congress, right? And the whole topic of the congress was to decide whether the people in Latin America were in fact people, right? Um, funny enough, that had to be discussed, you know, because many people did not consider us people, but animals like barbarians, you know, like um, entes with no souls, right? And uh, Francisco de Vitoria became very famous because he defended, you know, the so-called Indians, and he became uh, the father of international rights. Um, basically, what he argued is that Indians, you know, were in fact, that we were in fact human beings, but not as mature or cognitively developed as the Spaniards, and thus, you know, require the Spaniards' guidance, right? Um, so from this aspect of, you know, like the Spaniards being superior that we were, then emerged something that it is uh, defined as colonial difference, which in many ways places human beings at different levels of worth, according to an ontological and epistemological rationale, right? At the beginning, this one was um, more connected to, to race, right? In Mexico, for example, the first categories were, you know, basically the Spanish and then the criollos, right? You know, basically um, uh, children from Spanish parents who were born in Mexico, and then the mestizos, and then the, the indigenous people, and then at the bottom of the land were the, um, the Africans who, who were brought as, as slaves. Right, and uh, we can talk about you know different uh, categories or um, that actually now exist. You know, rich and poor, uh, basically uh, big city people from small town people, and you know men and women that in many ways really speak to this colonial difference. Right, and um, Eduardo Galeano's poem really really illustrates this very vividly for me, and uh, what I'll also like to argue later that in many ways. This is not a so-called indigenous people's issue that it really, really pertains to, to all of us. But let me entertain you with some uh, poetry here. This is Los Nadies by Eduardo Galeano. Sueñan las pulgas con comprarse un perro y sueñan los nadies con salir de pobres. Que algún mágico día llueva de pronto la buena suerte, que lleva a cántaros la buena suerte. Pero la buena suerte no llueva ayer, ni hoy, ni mañana, ni nunca, ni en lloviznitas que del cielo la buena suerte. Por mucho que los nadies la llamen y aunque les pique la mano izquierda o se levanten con el pie derecho o empiecen el año cambiando de escoba. Los nadies, los hijos de nadie, los dueños de nada, que no son aunque sean, que no hablan idiomas sino dialectos, 
que no profesan religiones sino supersticiones, que no hacen arte sino artesanía, que no practican cultura sino folclor, que no son seres humanos sino recursos humanos, que no tienen cara sino brazos, que no tienen nombre sino número, que no figuran en la historia universal sino en la crónica roja de la prensa local. Los nadies que cuestan menos que la bala que los mata. Um, And again, this is like, well, this none really pertain to me. This is more for indigenous people in Latin America. And thank God I'm not indigenous, you know. But let's talk about from Los Nadies from my ELT perspective. Los Nadies en ELT. Que no nos parecemos a Brad Pitt o Britney Spears, sino a Mario López o Evo Morales. Que no hablamos inglés británico americano, sino mexican English, like the sexy, sexy Mexican accent that Mario has. Que no evaluamos, sino nos evalúan. ¿no? ETS, sino de Common European Framework of Reference, Cambridge, sino Trinity College. Que no producimos libros de texto, sino consumimos libros de texto. Que no somos profesionistas, sino técnicos de la educación. Right? And um, we can actually go over that, and I really wish, you know, um, you know, we could interact this way. So please, please feel free um, to add to this poem, if you think, uh, if you agree with it, or maybe to reject it with that, and then we can talk more about it um, in the discussion section. So, um, but again, you know, trying to connect this, this issue of modernity and coloniality and ELT, right, um, one, um, one of the big things about, you know, this theory is how um, the rhetoric of modernity in many ways is connected to salvation, novelty, progress, and development, right? So um, back at the beginning, you know, um, 500 years ago, you know, we needed to be saved, right? Because according to, to the Spanish people, we didn't have souls, so they gave us religion, right? And, uh, you know, according to them, you know, we were actually backward, primitive, right? So they brought novelty, you know, they brought progress and development, right? But if we look at the history, um, Carefully, we can actually see that that novelty and progress and development was actually was caused because of many of the great cultures that we have, like the Mayas and the Zapotecs and the Incas. Knowledge was erased and actually seen as diabolic, right, as something not uh, not important, right. So, but this, um, you know, this is um, what we are arguing is that this is not really an issue that actually occurred 500 years ago, but actually still is part of this. Um, um, today's, you know, um, history, right? And here we have, you know, um, you know, I know how important Simón Bolívar is in, in Colombia, something that the whole Latin America owes. And now look at this now, uh, new Simón Bolívar, or the connection between the U.S. and um, in Brazil, now with Paul Sarano and, you know, what's happening with uh, people in the Amazon, right? And uh, the current just later um, history of um, what happened in Bolivia, you know, with the Coup d'etat against uh, Evo Morales and uh, and how you know basically people in power are in mess. Here we have Trump saying like, "Cómo no la voy a reconocer si yo la hice," right? And then here we have this idea of the Bolivian people and uh, basically the people in power, right? This actually changed, as we know, you know, like very very recently, like maybe two or three weeks ago, that uh, the Bolivian people took power back again. But actually, just last night, the elected president actually was um, attempted. Um, they attempted to murder him. So there's a lot of issues here that is about controlling issues. Um, and more pertaining to, you know, basically the ELT, you know, English in Latin America, here we have, you know, basically some uh, English institutes, you know, selling you the idea that if you learn English, then you're going to change your future. And what is not stated here is that basically they're saying that you have to change your future is because your present sucks. That's what they don't tell you. Right? But that's the whole, you know, basically um, discourse of modernity and coloniality. It's like they present you with this brighter future. It's because your present is terrible now. So, but if you only learned English, then you can do it. And of course, then um, this is um, connected to economics, right? Here we have like, ya no más que baje el dólar, right? Um, saying that as soon as I have money to, to spare, then I will invest in my life actually to get better. So this is entrenched. And uh, here we have other depictions. No, it's not only Harmon Hale, but also Berlitz and, you know, other institutes that actually promise like a, like future doctor, future engineer, you know, future scientist, right? And how this the whole world is open to you if only if you learn the language of power and the language of modernity as it is now. Um, 
And, um, you know, they go actually go further and saying, like, well, if you don't actually have the money to go to Europe, maybe you can get laid and get a spring breaker. And uh, I've been studying English for, you know, 22 years. And believe me, I haven't actually hooked up with a spring breaker. But anyway, maybe your your story is different than mine. Um, but then um, modernity and, you know, the, these promises, then we ask you, really? You know, uh, Peter Sayer, you know, later today will be speaking about the you know, social class and, and these issues. But... Let me show you something about, you know, how English may not actually impact uh, people's lives as it is actually believed. Antes no sabía inglés y era lavaplatos. Ahora sí inglés y soy dishwasher, ¿no? So is it really English changing my life? Right? Um, and here, um, you know, this is probably uh, to means what one of my um, former students posted and how this is um, advertised in different countries like Argentina, Chile, Spain, right? Se solicita maestro de inglés. And this is what happens in, in Mexico and see whether this is actually the same story in, in Colombia. Se solicita maestro de inglés. Disponibilidad de horario, buena presentación, que domine mejor el idioma que un nativo, 10 años de experiencia, maestría en educación, otra maestría en enseñanza del idioma inglés, doctorado en idiomas, que tenga TOEFL, TOEIC, IELTS, 2, 3, TKT con banda 4 y que les pagan 75 pesos la hora, sin prestaciones, sin seguros, sin bonos, right? It's actually true in my state. Uh, people who actually teach languages make them less than $4 uh, dollar, um, US, you know, an hour with no benefits whatsoever. Um, so um, in those, in this aspect then, you know, what, what is it for us then, right? So what we argue is that we need to start decolonizing um, ELT in Latin America and in Mexico, right? And uh, basically then recognize and should refer to challenge these, these grand narratives and dignify Latin American people, right? Here we have, you know, even just starting with the, uh, with the history of Latin America. You know, teacher, when Christopher Columbus discovered, we have the girl says like, my mommy says Christopher was a como mierda who didn't discover shit, right? And uh, this is a recent cartoon, actually, that was in, in the press like a month ago. Uh, this is the statue of, uh, that I showed you before of Christopher Columbus. People, uh, feminists who were protesting uh, here and who actually was, you know, were aware of this uh, coloniality aspect, actually then so-called vandalized, you know, the, the statue of Christopher Columbus. And uh, Christopher Columbus, here we have, like, que no me vengan a descubrir, ojalá, right? For us to decolonize, it means grabbing the bull by, you know, by the horns, right, and bringing down walls. Um, I would not attempt to do this, right, because he may bite or you may not find much in there. So maybe try somewhere else for that. For us to decolonizing means understanding who's behind the discourses from a historical perspective, right, and use English to actually talk back. And this is a recent cartoon that actually um, is how the OEA Right, um, you know, basically, is is enmeshed in all this this history. So, like, fraudy presidente que se aferra al poder. Probamos un golpe de ah, ah no ah no right. Maybe that's we cannot do you know actually do a coup d'état, un golpe de estado in the U.S. as they have done in Latin America, right? Or you know how you know for example that even though you know we may see this guy as you know the bad guy now, Trump how Biden in many ways represents, you know, the, the history of the U.S. and how it has actually um, invaded and uh, conquered, you know, in, in new terms, you know, Latin America. So for us, you know, like what these cartoonists do, this is decolonizing as best, you know, using uh, the English language then to talk back, right? So no Biden, no Biden, discriminate the guerra, and you saw it tramposo and racista, right? So what is it that we can use, you know, English for our own terms and actually to talk about? That's what we mean by decolonizing. And decolonizing for us means valuing and appreciating the work of my Colombian friends and colleagues. You know, many of no, uh, many of you, you know many of them and many others, I'm sure, as the wonderful presentation I, I've been hearing in this conference, who have actually been um, problematizing and uh, critical analyzing the role of English in, in Colombia, for example, in, uh, in the policies of uh, Colombia bilingue and uh, what, uh, what that actually meant for people, for indigenous peoples, or how actually that rhetoric did not address issues of social class and exclusion, right? And of course, you know, the great work of Fals Borda who has inspired you know, many things. So we do um, have to start, you know, basically looking at the South, you no? Know? El Sur también existe, you no? Know? Um, so we need to start actually paying attention to those theories because in many ways with this coloniality aspect, we always look back, you know, up North or Europe to look for answers when actually, um, 
the answers have been here. You may not know, but you know, uh, last year I was in Colombia and I learned, for example, the ASOCOPI, the association is actually, um, is older than TESOL. Then TESOL is recognized as the conference of the world and not ASOCOPI. So that really actually speaks to issues of power, to issues of coloniality of being and coloniality of, um, of knowledge, right? So we really need to start looking at ourselves in order to understand what or how to decolonize CLT in America. And finally, because I want now Birma to take over, uh, we argue that decolonizing means valuing our languages and ourselves, most importantly, right? For us, you know, people are important, not languages, right? For us, what really, really matters is how people feel, you know, about who they are and where actually they stand in the world and how they can actually speak back, right? So it really means uh, um, moving from being a nobody to being somebody, Right? So we need to start really, really seeing ourselves as the nobodies and becoming the somebodies who can challenge these discourses, right? So now um, I'm going to pass the microphone to my uh, colleague, uh, Vilma Huerta, who's going to uh, tell you about a, a project, a small project, qualitative study project, um, that we actually conducted at the University of Oaxaca that in many ways has decolonizing as, a, as one of its goals. Okay, Vilma, go for it. Thanks, Dr. Mario López, thanks, uh, Dr. Álvaro Quintero, thanks to conference organizers, thanks to Francisco José de Caldas University, and thanks to the audience. My name is Vilma Huerta, and the name of the project that we are presenting today is Undergrad Mestizo Students and Indigenous People Building the Foundations uh, for Teaching and Learning Foreign and Indigenous Languages uh, Through Reciprocal Peer Learning. Next one. Uh, the research uh, question of this project is what do undergrad mestizo students and indigenous people learn by interacting through reciprocal peer learning? Next one. Uh, to begin, it is important uh, to mention that reciprocal peer learning is a cooperative methodology based on the creation of pairs where individuals will be called A and B. Uh, a is the tutor, uh, prepares a lesson plan to teach a specific academic topic to B, who is the tutee. Then the roles are switched, so V becomes the tutor and prepares a lesson plan to teach a specific academic topic to A, uh, who is now the tutee. Reciprocal peer learning process is assisted and monitored by a professor. Next one, Mario. Um, we developed this project in the language teaching VA program that belongs to the language department of the State University of Oaxaca, Mexico, which is a public university. Uh, to give you a general idea about our context, Oaxaca is located in the south of Mexico. Oaxaca is the state with the highest number of native languages and native speakers in Mexico. It is also one of the poorest states uh, where indigenous communities live in margination. Uh, because of these conditions, migration to big cities inside the country or to the U.S. is an option for many indigenous people. Besides, uh, there is a poor and folkloric vision of these indigenous communities. Next one. Uh, the participants uh, in this uh, project were divided into two groups. The undergrad students were assigned to one group, group A. All these students were born and raised in the urban context. Uh, they will become language teachers in the future, especially uh, for teaching English and Spanish, but currently they are also learning additional languages like French, Chinese, and Zapoteco. In the other group, group B, were the indigenous people. They were all born and raised in indigenous communities. Some of them are elementary teachers, uh, others are farmers, and some others are merchants. As you can see, uh, we have participants with different backgrounds and different contexts. Next one. 
there are uh, four important concepts uh, that we use in this project decolonization, horizontal relationships, intercultural education, and cooperative learning. Uh, according to Lopez Gopar, decolonizing language teaching uh, means to create a space where participants renegotiate their identities in order to recognize and value the different ways of being, speaking, and knowing, breaking down the idea that the schools and classrooms are homogeneous spaces. Next one. The second concept, horizontal relationships, is defined as a social and cultural phenomenon where participants constantly negotiate their meanings. Through this negotiation, uh, participants construct knowledge. And what is uh, remarkable for this concept is that both voices participate in a more equitable discourse exchange. Next one. The next uh, concept uh, is intercultural education, which means the right to have a cultural identity, to receive high quality education and to fight against uh, exclusion, especially for those groups that have been locked down on by the system. Finally, cooperative uh, learning means that a small group of participants share a common goal all of them engage actively and learn to develop thinking skills. Um, they become protagonists of the learning processes and develop communication and social skills. Basically, participants work face-to-face uh, -face and the success of each member is connected to the rest of the team and vice versa. In this process, participants renegotiated and not just a academic topics, but also their identities, differences, and conflict resolution skills. The next one. Uh, in this project, we use um, the qualitative research methodology and to collect the data, uh, we use interview, focus group, and reflected uh, notes. Next one, please. Now I'm going, I'm going to tell you about the steps of teaching and learning followed by students and indigenous people. First, they receive communication and social skills training and peer tutoring training. This training was important to help the participants to have a better understanding of the process and to learn about the responsibilities and the benefits of both roles. Second, next one, please. Participants got uh, to know each other in order, uh, in order to have a deeper knowledge of each one, for example, about their culture, language, and economic activities. Next one. After uh, the training, the participants and the leaders of the project form the peers using, uh, peers, uh, using three criteria. The first one was reciprocal peer tutoring, which means that participants alternated tutor and tutor roles. All participants had the opportunity to get benefits from providing and receiving academic support, since this kind of structure helps to build a horizontal relationship among participants. The second one was cross backgrounds, uh, because participants have different experiences and academic profiles. The last, uh, the last one was cross context because participants came from different contexts, which were urban and indigenous communities. Next one. Uh, peer uh, tutoring pairs were constituted in the next form. In the first pair, um, one indigenous uh, speaker teaching Iskateco to the student and learning Chinese from the student. Then uh, Chocholteco, uh, English, Chocholteco and Zapoteco, Chontal, French, Chocholteco, English and Chontal, English. English. Next, please. After having assigned the pair, 
first all participants prepare a lesson plan to teach uh, their indigenous or foreign languages. Uh, the lesson uh, plans gave participants a uh, support for teaching. After, uh, next please. After we finish the peer tutoring process, uh, the participants reflect about the experience of teaching and learning. Next one. Now I'm going to talk about the findings of the project, uh, fo focusing on three emergent themes. The first emergent theme is valuing interpersonal communication and interculturalism. The participants uh, said the following. In this course, we learned that it's very important to pay attention to our partner because when you are paying attention to other person, you are sending a message to the other person is important to me. Next one. Another participant said, this experience means that two cultures are interacting. In this experience, we learn about our communities, families, and economic organizations. When we talk about an indigenous language or any other language, it means there is a group of people who have a life, a culture. Next, please. The second emergent theme was empowering and embracing diversity. An indigenous speaker said, I can share my language and culture. This is very important because most of the, uh, the time, people think that we have nothing uh, to share, that we are weak. Teaching my language makes me feel important. And a student said, teaching friends, uh, French and learning Chocholteco made me feel important because I try to do my best as a teacher and I try to do my best as a student too. I learn in both roles. Next one. Finally, a pair concluded, we are different, we speak different languages, and precisely because we are different, it was possible to do this experience of teaching and learning. The, different, uh, the difference among us were uh, positive. Next one. The third emergent theme was indigenous speakers as agents of change. One participant said, to preserve our indigenous language, we have to fight, we have to go to different places, government offices, organization, we cannot stop. A student said, we talk about the responsibilities of universities to preserve indigenous languages. My indigenous partner said that this was the first time that they were physically in a university and also the first time sharing their knowledge and teaching their languages. We concluded that universities have to open their doors to indigenous people. They can teach us. Next one. Finally, another student said, this is the first time that I am working with an indigenous person. My partner came here to teach me about his language, but especially to share his culture, lifestyle, and all the activities that they do to preserve their languages. But for sure, uh, this student had already uh, been in touch with indigenous classmates because we have a large community of indigenous students in our program. The fact that this student thought um, that she had never interacted with an indigenous person before is because sometimes the way professors structure or lessons doesn't allow students to have a deeper personal contact and realize about the value of these languages and cultural differences. Um, thank you, and now my colleague, Dr. Lopez, is going to share uh, with you the implications and conclusions of the project. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Vilma, thank you so much. Um, so let's focus now on you know, what actually this means, you know, uh, especially going back to the theory, you know, from, from now the theory to um, 
the research and then back to the theories and, and to a, a bigger context, right? Well, the first thing that we need to, uh, you know, what this implies is we need to start changing language ideologies, right? Uh, especially uh, from uh, modernity and coloniality aspects, even the, the mere distinction between so-called modern languages and indigenous languages is highly problematic, right? Because so-called modern language, you know, uh, when I got my, my doctorate back in Canada, right, it was called the Modern Language Center, right? Um, by that mere distinction, it, it immediately uh, excludes uh, not only indigenous people by First Nation languages, actually, that have been... The, in many ways set aside or actually seen not only as um, inferior languages, but even to uh, to the mere fact that they're referred to as dialects, right? They're not so important that, you know, people, for example, in Oaxaca don't even call them uh, uh, languages, but they call them dialectos, right? Because, you know, they're not so important, they need to change. So we need to um, start seeing, especially uh, when we're uh, working in language preparation programs, we need to start creating this idea that, you know, we need to uh, look at the uh, uh, language regimes, you know, the, the power behind languages and what actually that means for their structure, for their preservation from their learning, right? It is not a mere coincidence that, for example, indigenous parents are not teaching indigenous languages to their kids because uh, historically they have actually been punished, they have been actually um, gone through a very, very rough history uh, for actually speaking those. Right, so um, we need to uh, then break away from this uh, so-called modern language uh, indigenous distinction. The other implication that we need to address is the importance of universities um, getting involved in this project. You know, we actually um, the the indigenous people and and also our undergrad uh, students uh, basically emphasize the the importance of the institutions. You know, have the the right, but the obligation, the moral and uh, historical and political obligation, right, to start changing, you know, the, these ideologies and these um, basically views of coloniality in order uh, for uh, people who have not been part of a school system to be actually um, given the message that they are important and they have something to contribute because it has been actually historically universities are the one that provide the knowledge and never the other way around. So this has to start changing and universities have a major role. Um, just, uh, you know, this presentation is titled The Subjectification of Languages. And uh, for us, you know, uh, the subjectification of languages is a must in decolonizing projects, right? Uh, people, right, as you may remember from the beginning of the presentation, right, the uh, the first discussion between the Spanish people was whether it actually were or not people. And in many ways nowadays, you know, it seems to me that many people are more focused on languages and not on people. Even in indigenous studies, you know, for example, many people doing research with indigenous languages, they're actually, they care more about the languages. They care about, you know, um, for example, uh, creating dictionaries, grammars of this, right? But they don't really care much about the people. And that's, that is highly problematic, you know, because in many ways it is the people that is important. I remember Kathy Escamilla, professor from the States, you know, she um, she quoted a Mexican uh, person in the States saying, like, what happens in the U.S. is that um, American people, or so-called Anglo people, like lo mexicano, but no los mexicanos, right? Uh, so Maria, I'm they, sorry for, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Professor yes. Lopez, for yes. interrupting you. No, it's okay. Uh, we have uh, five, minutes, right? five minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, then it is, who is it that we care more about? You know, the languages or the people, right? So for us, you know, decolonization is about people, not languages, right? And the decolonization needs to be carried out by people interacting in a horizontal relationship, like we actually um, did in this project where uh, both people had different roles and at one point there were teachers and another point students and vice versa, right? And I think once people are in these two different roles, this this is where you can start breaking the uh, um, the vertical relationship as to I am the teacher and you are the student. I am the colonizer and you're the colonized. I am the person who has the power and you're not, right? So we need to start creating more horizontal relationship with that. So um, 
Finally, uh, talking about you know what we do, uh, Bill and I are part of a language teacher preparation program, right? So we work with future language um, uh, teachers, right? But we like to see those not as language teachers, not as uh, English teachers, as French teachers, but we like to see them more as language educators, right? That the main role should not actually just be teaching English or French or Chinese or Zapotec to the kids, but they actually need to um, start uh, being agents of change like the indigenous people. And, um, and basically what this means is that developing critical language education involves student teachers engagement in critical intercultural relationships, right? Many of them, for example, stated that that was the first time that they interacted with an indigenous speaker or that they had heard about the indigenous language, but they had never actually interacted with a, with a speaker. And that was life changing for them, right? We also argue that critical intercultural education is possible when participants interact in real situation valuing positive their knowledge differences. As one student said, it is what the difference that actually made this possible, right? Because in many ways, you know, difference has been as inferiority, you know, uh, otherness and disabledness, right? Which is the colonial difference. But difference in itself is really good, but we should not see it as a colonial difference, right? And then uh, cooperative learning could help um, decolonize relationships and build a real intercultural education. We really think that as long as we cooperate, you know, between people, again, this is what the colonizing can start, you know, becoming real. As a conclude, right, we argue that cooperative learning in the colonizing projects allows us to create a space where people can share their stories, right? As you probably um, remember from Bilma's presentation, it's like the students not only actually teach each other uh, the language, but they, you know, they, they talk about, they got to know each other. So it is, you know, hearing from them, you know, that actually may start breaking down colonial assumptions that actually regards other people, indigenous, um, ELT, uh, so-called non-native speakers, right? As, as so much deficient that need to be changed, right? And, uh, and of course, it, you know, cooperative learning also allows us to build a horizontal relationship between people. You know? Well, muchas gracias. And uh, Bill and I would like to thank you and uh, now open you know, the floor to, uh, to questions, hopefully, and we can interact. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is that okay, Cesar? Uh, yes, Professor Lopez, okay. there's Thank no so problem. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, Professor Huerta, Professor Lopez, we have some comments uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, the, the uh, session, from the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, in here, Ramirez Julian said, English language is usually label, labeled as the salvation for Colombian teach students and teacher. Uh, Kevin Prieto also left a comment that intercul the intercultural communication perspective has a critical role in the learning to teach the process of the student uh, teachers as well. Ramirez Julian uh, provides us with another uh, comment and a question. Uh, Colombian language policies only recognize bilingualism as Spanish English bilingualism, ignoring indigenous languages or dialects. What is the Mexican language policy like? Mm -hmm. um, just go, going back to the first comment, I think it is important to, to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the, the issue of English being sold as the modern language, as the language that is going to give you opportunities, is actually exactly the same in, the, in Mexico as well. Going back to the question, it's exactly the same phenomenon that we have. Um, bilingual here really means English and Spanish. We have an interesting phenomenon uh, going on in, um, in Oaxaca now um, that uh, especially elite um, you know, schools, right, are actually, um, uh, by terms of marketing, they're labeled the same as bilingual, right? But that immediately uh, means um, basically English and Spanish and no other language, right? Um, basically, uh, in Romaine's view, you know, from perspective, that will be sort of like elite bilingualism, right? And then the others will be like folk um, bilingualism. Um, that is slowly changing. Right, um, because now, um, especially with different decolonizing movements, but also uh, the fact that Oaxaca is a tourist, um, you know, state, right? Indigenous uh, culture and languages are being sold as exotic, right? 
And now even some elite bilingual schools are offering, for example, Zapotec, right? As a way to show that, look how open we are, look how uh, receptive we have to other cultures, right? But again, you know, the, the issue is whether actually those elite bilingual uh, schools uh, care more about Zapoteco del Istmo rather than people from Zapotec, you know, from that area. I wonder if that makes sense, but again, that's why our emphasis and the subjectification of languages, right? You may, for example, offer an indigenous language as part of your university curriculum or a bilingual school, but if you still regard um, indigenous people as those people, as, you know, people with weird cultures, people with that, then basically we're not in many ways decolonizing. Um, you know, then for us, then the important part of, you know, becoming bilingual or multilingual, like, you know, um, uh, bilingual Colombia, is an issue of recognition, of mutual uh, valuing each other, of mutual uh, collaboration, mutual respect, that actually should be part of what we do on a daily basis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lopez, we have more comments. Yes, uh, so, uh, the next uh, comment that we have is from Kevin Prieto. He says, I found interesting the participation of native indigenous language speakers as it empowers the local knowledge uh, there and positions it as an important element in the community. And he also asks a question, uh, what Dr. Hilario, Hilario Chi Canul does in Chetumal? Um, can you repeat the, the question, the last part? The yeah, sure. Uh, what does Dr. Hilario Chi Canul does in Chetumal? There's a lot of studies. I'm not really familiar. I don't want to lie to you. I'm not really familiar with, with his work. But, you know, um, the you know the indigenous studies all over Mexico is, is quite powerful, right? Um, the only thing that we, um, you know, criticize, you know, with those studies, especially many of them, is like the issue of focusing more on the language itself, right? The so-called preservation of uh, Mayan language, the so-called preservation of Zapotec language, and not the fact of, uh, for example, children, especially new generation kids learning that language or that language being part of um, of the uh, regular day-to-day -day thing. According, for example, to the Mexican constitution, indigenous people should receive uh, services, legal medical services in their language, right? But of course, that is not many ways uh, applied in this in this, uh, in this societies yet, right? Again, you know, the issue is like basically acknowledging, you know, um, you know, indigenous languages, but not really um, being part of the society as, as a day-to-day -day thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have uh, another uh, comment by Magda Martinez. She uh, says, it wasn't clear when you mentioned the, colon the colonizing is about people, not languages. Uh, so could you explain us a little bit more? Thank you for your lecture. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, once again, you know, um, in many ways, when, when it really comes down to um, to Spanish, you know, to indigenous languages, um, a lot of studies, especially from linguistics, for purely pure linguistics, focus more on the preservation of languages, right? Um, I even imagine indigenous languages being preserved in a jar so they can be historical, you know, uh, artifacts that we can, you know, don't touch them because they may break, right? But, uh, for example, the indigenous people growing up in urban centers, for, for instance, right? When they start, um, for example, learning Spanish in, in Mexico, then they start, you know, like, you know, mixing the language or so, trans language and whatever you want to call them, right? But those kids then they say, oh, those kids, you know, they're losing their culture, they're losing their languages, right? So, you know, those kids are regarded as, you know, you know what's going on with those kids? No son de ni allá ni de allá, ni de aquí ni de allá. Same thing that happens to uh, Mexican people in the U.S., right? So... Then, um, for example, we may, in the U.S., for instance, right, we may actually think that we, uh, we appreciate Spanish, but we don't like so-called cholos, so we don't like so-called raza there, right? So same thing in, in Mexico, right? We may say that we are in favor of indigenous languages, but we would not hire a person who looks like indigenous uh, people, right? So for us, then, that's why, you know, uh, what it really is important is to focus on the person and not in the language. For us, in, in the project, for example, that Dr. Vilma reported, and she can speak more to this, is that uh, the main thing that the students came 
or, or gain from that experience was not learning uh, Chontal, was not learning uh, uh, Cholteco, the languages that the, the people, but actually just interacting with someone by actually seeing, you know, that indigenous uh, person as someone who can teach them. That was actually what that they actually gained more in that. So it was the appreciation of, you know, the indigenous people and also the appreciation of um, indigenous speakers, you know, for the um, undergrad students in Oaxaca, that was the most powerful aspect on that, right? You wanna comment on that, Vilma? I think that is especially what your students uh, actually mentioned about the experience and the importance of actually uh, getting to know people and what it, that meant for them. Yes, okay. the most uh, important experience for them yes, was yes. the fact that they they were uh, learning from an indigenous uh, people and learning not just uh, the language, but learning the culture, learning, learning um, uh, about their communities. And I think this is very important uh, for educators with a critical vision because uh, in the classrooms, um, we, we don't have uh, just students uh, learning uh, uh, academic topics. I think uh, the classroom um, are a space where people are coming with their identities, with their kind of life. And I think that is very important to share, to spread, uh, spread in, the, in the classroom. And in, in this experience, this, uh, the, the students uh, mm -hmm. knew that um, uh, the indigenous uh, people can teach them because we have the idea that you, we, you, uh, that the students just teach uh, indigenous people, and now, no, it's very important to create a horizontal relationship because this is very important to renegotiate all these um, ideas about coloniality, uh, uh, change our way to to teach etc. Okay, uh, well, we have more comments. Uh, please, please. Catherine Hazel West uh, says, thank you, this was absolutely fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Amparo Clavi, who says, thank you, Mario and Vilma, your valuable ideas enrich us and inform language teacher education. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Yolanda Samaha, Samaka Borg is, uh, says, thanks, Professor Mario and Vilma for this insightful presentation. Professor Jimena Bonilla also says, thank you very much much for the presentation. And uh, we have two more questions uh, from Julian Ramirez. Uh, he asks, uh, do you foster native language learning in public schools and universities? And his second question is, is, all, is English also mandatory if you want to graduate? Yeah, the, the first question is like, um, once again, um, you know, for us, you know, what is really, really important is not just actually teaching languages per se, right? So we don't really uh, support the idea of, you know, um, for example, erasing English and then bringing indigenous languages into universities or into public schools, for example. That has to be renegotiated, you know, with actually what the people want in a specific communities, right? Because if you take that uh, either or policy, then, you know, you're basically excluding things. You know, this, this notion of decolonizing is by no means that we have something against, you know, English or French, and we should replace it with so-called indigenous languages, right? What we need to do is problematize the discourses that actually uh, present English as better, as more modern, and indigenous languages are not, not really important, right? So then the inclusion of those indigenous languages has to be um, talked about. For example, in our university uh, in Oaxaca, we have more than 100 indigenous languages, you know, as part of the state. So um, by including one uh, indigenous language as part of the curriculum, then the question is, how did you decide as to what of those indigenous languages to teach and why not the others, right? So in many ways that actually speaks to, oh, well, this one, because this one has more speakers, this one has more things, and immediately creates a, a hierarchy between um, basically languages. So what we decided to do is that we started to uh, include as part of our curriculum, the languages that our, our students, teachers actually teach, that actually the languages that they speak, right? So because we wanted the students to feel that their language that they bring to the campus is acknowledged, right? And that if we had space for many indigenous languages that we should create it and, and, and have sort of like an open view 
um, to that. Uh, regarding to the second question as to uh, whether English is mandatory, yes, it's part of actually, um, we don't have a clear language policy uh, in place in Mexico, but we have a so-called de facto language policy, right? That in many ways, um, for example, even in the in public elementary schools for many years, from 1974, right? Um, we were we had in our boleta, in our report card, right? Lengua adicional al español, right? It was not stated that it was English, but all the schools, you know, basically taught English, right? So because they say, oh, let's leave it open to other languages. But of course, you know, the, the policy in place is English, right? But, you know, again, that really speaks to how English is actually brought in into, into the issue. And now public um, elementary schools and uh, especially are piloting, you know, for example, English from an early uh, age. And of course, English is mandatory in the secondaries, uh, high schools and uh, universities. And some universities require a certain level of English to graduate or, for example, their thesis, their abstract might, must be in a, um, and for example, in English, or for example, the major scholarships, you know, to study abroad, of course, require 550 in the top of scores, right? You know, with Carlos' presentation, I should have asked the same question back to Carlo yesterday as to saying that, so how is it that, you know, decolonizing uh, attempts in many ways, you know, you know, basically hit the wall of assessment because in many ways that's what really disempowering that as long as we don't uh, change those policies at the university levels, at school levels, you know, we'll be kidding ourselves because our students may say, well, you may not tell me, though you may think that English is not as important, but if I don't graduate, I don't get a job and things. So that's, um, that's, that's a whole issue. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, there, uh, there are uh, other couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Julian Hernandez Contreras says, uh, very insightful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John Wilmer says, excellent presentation. Thank you for the lecture. Okay. And uh, Carlo has a question mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> so okay. I'm going to deactivate my audio Thank so you. we can take the floor now. Thank you. Hello, Carlo. Mario. Hello, Vilma. Thank, uh, thank you for the presentation. I found it very connected to what's happening here in Colombia, uh, many common aspects. I had a question you touched, mm -hmm. uh, you touched on a bit uh, in your previous answer, but I wanted to know about the challenges trying to do this at the university, mm -hmm. because yeah. I guess there were like probably some issues because we know that universities tend to be like very aesthetic mm -hmm. and they don't accept like these proposals that we bring. So how, how did you yeah. manage doing that? Uh, yeah, the, the first thing that, you know, we need to create like a, a true revolution, right, to, to change, you know, for example, the main um, the main BA program, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the previous program, you know, had uh, learning uh, English and French, that was it, right? So the major curricular change that we did is like, okay, it's going to be English because we had no, you know, we're still no not at the stage of, you know, stopping that in Spanish, again, colonial aspects. But, you know, first of all, let's open up and if the students want to um, learn a, a third or an additional language, then let's at least open up the floor, right, uh, to those languages. Now we offer French, you know, German, Zapotec, and Mije, right? Uh, change is, is very, very slow. Um, I need to be honest with you and real with you. The first time well, we offered an indigenous language as part of our BA program, three students registered, you know, out of 150 um, students in our program, only three students registered. But then little by little, but, you know, talking about this issue, but actually the, the, the students um, learning about that Zapotec was being in place. You know, nowadays, you know, for example, um, 25, 30 students a year uh, actually elect those programs. So change is very, very slow. And uh, what we've noticed is that actually students start to convince each other, right? Um, the student teachers don't listen to professors, right? I actually went into the line saying, oh, you should study Zapotec, right? But then once the students were actually um, learning Zapotec and they were telling each other about, you know, how cool this language was, you know, the different opportunities actually they created for that or how uh, English did not create opportunities or French did not create opportunities and that, you know, they had a better chance of actually learning a local language, you know, rather than a foreign language that actually 
uh, many students actually um, started uh, being, for the sake of time, we decided not to focus on this, but you know, the Zapotec teacher who is a graduate from our program, who is now a current uh, professor, actually teaches English, uh, Zapotec and Spanish. So Chiara, you know, the, the speaker there, uh, is not just regarded as this indigenous, you know, static person. She's it's a beautiful woman, very, very modern study. You know, she goes from teaching English to teaching Zapotec to, to being the coordinator. Right, um, so she breaks down these notions of the indigenous person that needs to be saved. Right, so um, you know, just to answer your question, that it does really take a lot of examples and actually people talking to people uh, to start actually uh, bringing this idea of decolonizing um, being actually a reality in their BA programs. But of course, you know, um, you know, society is still very, very colonial in, in place because many of our students, you know, when they graduate, when they go to get a job, it is their English accent, their uh, proficiency level that is um, better regarded rather than, you know, their experience with other languages. So we need to start, you know, basically getting at it more to, to change the views from employers and other people as well. Thank you very much, Mario. Sí, gracias, Carlos. Okay, well, there's one last comment. Yeah, so Magda Martinez says, thank you for your answers and reflections, professors Mario and Vilma. Thank you. And, uh, well, with uh, having said this, uh, we can conclude uh, this uh, plenary uh, for our 26th International Symposium on Research in Applied Linguistics. So, uh, Professor Huerta, Professor Lopez, Thank you for having uh, introduced us uh, to this uh, very insightful uh, issue uh, in ELT. Uh, of course, you are more than welcome to participate for <laughs> next year's uh, session. Mm -hmm. And also to all our audience, thanks a lot for uh, coming uh, to our plenaries. And of course, uh, it is important to remind you that our next concurrent sessions, the, our concurrent sessions are going to start now at three and five in a minute. Okay, everybody. So okay. see Gracias. you. Take care. You. Have Gracias. an excellent you, weekend. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Bye.